equanimity, the ability to keep the mind on an even keel in the face of pleasant and unpleasant things. To accept what has to be accepted is an attitude we're supposed to develop immeasurably. In other words, for all beings, without exceptions. But that has a different meaning as to whether we're talking about equanimity in action or equanimity at rest. At rest, it's a topic of concentration. And you sit here resting in the equanimity that you can extend everybody all over the world, regardless of equanimity for yourself, equanimity for others. That's, all, that's possible only from the fourth jhana and up. Prior to that, equanimity has to be in action, and it's immeasurable in a different way. What that means is whatever is needed for you to feel equanimity for, no matter how easy or how hard, you're able to do it. And it'll depend on the situation. Because remember, equanimity is never taught as a quality on its own. It's always part of other series. Particularly in the four Brahma Viharas, you need to develop it together with goodwill and compassion and empathetic joy. And you have to be able to draw on each of those when appropriate. So it's immeasurable, immeasurable in that way. that you want to have the skill that you can develop equanimity when you have to, regardless. But it's selective in another way. You focus on, on certain things and not on others. For example, when you're trying to get the mind to settle down in concentration, you have to have equanimity for the world, so you can focus on what you're doing right now. You have to have equanimity for the fact that you've got this body, whatever the physical conditions it has right now. But you, you don't just leave it there. You accept what you've got so that you can work with it. It's like going into the kitchen and finding that there's nothing but celery in the, in the refrigerator. So you try to figure out what are some good things you can make out of celery. Or there's nothing but a potato. You can't just eat the potato as it is. Celery you can pretty much eat as it is. Potatoes, though, you have to fix. You eat a raw potato, it's actually poisonous. So in a case like that, you accept the fact that that's what you've got, but then you do something with it out of Compassion for yourself, compassion for others, or goodwill for yourself, goodwill for others. So the equanimity is selective. Even more so as you're out dealing with people. There are some situations where you realize you can't make a difference, or you could make a difference, but it may not be worth it. Some people listening to the Brahma Viharas say that it sounds like what, that serenity prayer, wanting the ability to, to accept what you can't change, the courage to change what you can change, and the discernment or wisdom to know the difference. But life is a lot more complicated than that. There are a lot of things you can change, but it's not worth it. You could change, but it's not worth it. And that requires real discernment. Because even though we try to have equanimity and goodwill for everybody, we have limited resources. The attitudes may be unlimited, but our resources are not. In terms of your time, your energy, your monetary resources. 
there are limitations. And so you have to figure out, given the limitations, what's the best use of what you do have? And there may be some areas where you have to choose which battle you're going to fight. You can't fight two at once, or if you can fight two, but you can't fight three. You have to gauge your strength. Focus on the ones that are most worthwhile, and develop some equanimity for the things that are not. So here again, it's selective, immeasurable in the sense that you have to apply it whenever appropriate. As I said, equanimity in action is something that you apply in daily life. And even when you sit down to meditate, when the Buddha was telling Rahula to make his mind like earth, it's basically selective equanimity, because he wasn't going to be earth-like toward everything in the meditation. It was for whatever was unpleasant. And this was the instruction he gave before he taught breath meditation. And a breath meditation is not simply sitting there accepting whatever breath comes up. You work with the breath. You train yourself. You train yourself to breathe in a way where you're aware of the whole body, where you can calm bodily fabrication. You breathe in a way where you can be sensitive to rapture, sensitive to pleasure. Now these things don't happen on their own. They come from seeing what you've got, accepting what you've got, and then seeing there's possibilities. Remember, the Buddhist view of the world is not static. It's not things in and of themselves, or just as they are. It's more things as they're functioning. Because things function, they have potentials. And so you want to figure out what those potentials are and make the most of them. There's a lot you can do with the breath. There's a lot can, you can do with the simple fact that your mind talks to itself. That can become a factor of jhana. When it's listed as a factor of jhana, it seems exotic and strange. Some people say, well, how do I direct my thoughts and how do I evaluate? Well, you're doing it all the time. You think about a topic, and that's directing your thoughts. You make comments on it, that's evaluating it. It's simply a matter of now learning how to apply it to the breath and keep it with the breath. Keep the conversation on topic. Don't let it wander off into other areas. And learn how to evaluate wisely. As John Lee points out in the Factors for the First Jhana, directed thought is basically concentration. Singleness of preoccupation is concentration, but the evaluation is the beginning of your discernment as you're trying to get things to fit together. So you, don't simply, you don't simply accept what's there. You accept what's there so you can work with it. And things settle down to the point where you don't have to talk, about it, talk so much about it anymore. The mind's with the breath, the breath's with the mind. It seems like your awareness and the object of your awareness become one. Okay, then you can drop the directed thought and evaluation, just stop the chatter, and just be with the sensation coming in, sensation of the breath, sensation of the breath coming in, going out. Think of it welling up from within the body. The Buddha's image is of a spring at the base of a lake the water welling up inside, cooling the entire lake. You might hold that image in mind, and then allow it to grow still. The next image is of lotuses immersed in the water of the lake. The lake is still, and the lotuses are saturated with water from their roots to their tips. The breath grows still, and it finally gets to the point where it stops. That's where you're at equanimity, at rest. 
There's nothing you have to do at that point. Just maintain what you've got. Use it as a place for the mind to rest. After all, this is the level of concentration where the Buddha gained awakening. So it's a good foundation. It's a level of concentration from which he entered total nirvana. So it's a good place to rest, to get your bearings. It's at this point where your equanimity can be totally all around. But of course you just can't stay here forever. So a large part of the skill of equanimity is realizing when you can be at rest with it, and when you can have equanimity in action, and how the two differ. Equanimity at rest is total, all around. Equanimity in action has to be selective. And a large part of your discernment is figuring out where and when to apply it and where and when to apply the other Brahma powers. So when you understand this point, you can avoid a lot of the mistakes that come with thinking that you have to simply accept everything. There's that idea that if you want things to be different from the way they are, that's craving. Craving is a cause of suffering. You shouldn't do that. If you can't want things to be different from what, the way they are, how are you going to follow the path? How are you going to develop anything on the path? The path has to be motivated by desire. After all, right effort. You generate desire to give rise to skillful qualities, to abandon unskillful qualities. So that's a case where you don't simply accept what's there and leave it there. You accept what's there and try to develop its potentials. You extend equanimity to everything that's not related to what you're trying to accomplish right now. But keep your desire for change focused on what you're doing. When you understand that point, you can avoid a lot of the misunderstandings that come up around equanimity. As the Buddha said, it's not always appropriate that if you practice concentration and you simply develop equanimity, it's like a goldsmith who never puts the gold in the fire and never blows on it, he just looks at it. Nothing's going to happen to the gold when you just look at it. You put it in the fire, that's the effort of the practice. You blow on it, that's concentration. And you learn to figure out when is the appropriate time to do which task. And then you try to apply the same lessons to your daily life. There is at work where you have to really work hard on things to make changes. You have to be focused. Other areas where you have to just let them go, because they're going to distract you from the, the real work. It's an understanding equanimity that you can develop a lot of discernment. Both inside and out.